Okay, and let me see if I can uh, share the screen. Can you see my screen? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, uh, something is, oh, okay. Here it is. We're Let's seeing see. a launch meeting screen. Oh, I think I'm sharing incorrectly then. Let me stop and share another way. Okay. Is that better? No. Yes. Good. Okay, and can people see the uh, videos of of the listeners here, and or is that just visible to me? I guess it's just visible. We, we see quantum computing for dogs, all clear. Okay, um, so uh, well, this is always in the way. How to build a device that cannot be built, and. Um, Never know where to put this uh, band. I guess you can see the band in front of me, the share no. top. Oh, you can. No, we, oh. we do not see it. Oh, good. It's All just right. there to annoy you. I see. Well, that should make it fun. How to build a device that cannot be built. And I'd like to thank, uh, actually, I should thank you, Lou, and uh, uh, Roger uh, Fenn for uh, inviting me here to speak today. Um, the uh, PowerPoint slides I'll put up on my website for those people who would like to, to see the talk. And this talk is based on the following papers. Uh, the first paper is how to build a device that cannot be built. Uh, it's based on this one. I've actually put a link here in case you want to see it. It's public domain. And uh, let me get out of this, I guess back oops i did push the wrong button let me get out and continue um uh, and that paper in turn is based on the following two papers one by merman quantum mysteries revisited and another by greenberg berger horn and zylinger and um also, it's based on some um, chapters in my book. The meaning of quantum mechanics. And uh, there are many interpretations of quantum physics. And uh, if you want to have some fun, go speak to a group of friendly uh, physicists and mention one word. What is the meaning of quantum mechanics? Immediately, you'll have a very lively discussion. The dilemma of quantum physics is that the, uh, is as follows, the conundrum. There's almost universal agreement in regard to the laws of quantum mechanics. However, there is almost no total, there is almost total disagreement as to their meaning. Uh, there are many interpretations of quantum mechanics. One is the Copenhagen School. The other is the many worlds interpretation. Um, the other uh, is consistent his histories interpretation. There are many of them. Ensemble statistical, inter uh, statistical inter interpretation, et cetera. But the one that strikes me as um, most reasonable is the Irish pub interpretation. And this is John, Jonathan Dowling's uh, interpretation. After zero beers, uh, quantum mechanics is clear as mud. After one beer, somewhat clear. After two beers, very clear. And uh, after three, it's obvious. And after four, puzzling. And eventually, you're on the ground on your floor, flat out. Uh, why is quantum, what is quantum mechanics trying to tell us. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, simultaneous measurement of incompatible observables to unlimited precision is not possible. 
uh, bell inequalities, violation of the principle of reality or the principle of locality. We'll be talking about that. Co-conspector theorem, ditto. And recently the Con Conway uh, Koken uh, free will theorem, which is not about free will, um, essentially says that the past does not determine the future in quantum mechanics, unlike classical uh, mechanics. Uh, the objective of this talk, to investigate the greenberg horn zeilinger GHZ paradox using the tools of quantum information science and push the investigation to its limits. Uh, one result I can, is that a certain symmetric function in some sense can be interpreted as the non-locality involved in the indeterminism involved in the GHZ paradox. We'll also illustrate the subtlety of how you can control distributed uh, quantum systems. As always, no one agrees on anything. So when you keep this in mind, and if you'd like to join the, uh, the fray, you're more than welcome. I'd like to begin with a conundrum. Whoops, what's going on here? It's uh, apparently we have a uh, detour. And what I'd like to do is just give a brief introduction to quantum uh, mechanics uh, for the talk. Uh, so let's take a detour through uh, the fundamentals, some of them. A qubit Q is a quantum system with a two-dimensional complex Hilbert space, H as its state space. Uh, the vectors in H are called kets and are labeled in Dirac notation as so shown. Uh, you have a left and right delimiter and in between is simply a label referring to the object, the vector, are ket in the space. And for example, we have ket psi lying in the Hilbert space H. Uh, we choose in uh, H a standard orthonormal basis and denote it as so shown, ket zero and ket one. Now I'd like to, I mentioned a qubit, I'd like to see how we can actually visualize a qubit. And this involves description of what is called the block sphere. It's easy to visualize the state of a classical Shannon bit. It's simply a line segment, but how do we visualize the state of a qubit? And so far we, we've thought of the state of a single qubit as a ket in a two dimensional complex Hilbert space, but this is actually not fully correct. It's not a vector in a Hilbert space as a state. Actually for each lambda, each complex number, non-zero complex number, uh, any multiple of the kept psi is the same physical state. This is because a global phase lambda is not physically detectable. Hence, lambda psi and psi represent the same state as so indicated. And more precisely, a state is a complex line through the origin of the Hilbert space H. And uh, this is the state. The space of all complex lines through the origin is called complex projective space, CP1. And we now show how to visualize the qubit state CP1 as a surface of a ball, a two sphere. Questions anytime, please let me know. Uh, consider an arbitrarily chosen state of a qubit as so indicated. Um, for the time being, let's assume that the amplitude A not equal to zero um, is not equal to zero. We'll deal with that later. Then the state uh, is equivalent to um, the ket so shown, where B over A is simply a complex number. In this way, the state of a quantum system corresponds to a complex number, a number in the, a point in the complex plane. If A is equal to zero, we say that the state corresponds to the point at infinity. By adding that to the complex plane, we end up with the Riemann sphere. So the state of the space of a qubit can be identified with complex numbers union the point at infinity. 
Now in the complex plane, then uh, ket zero and ket one go to zero and infinity respectively. And I've li lifted or uh, shown on um, the left and the right, two other orthonormal bases, which we'll call ket plus and ket minus. Um, these were also points in the complex plane corresponding to plus one, minus one i and minus i respectively. And in general, um, the ket psi is mapped to b over a, which has um, is s plus i t. Uh, so here is the, we're visualizing the states of a qubit in the complex plane, as so indicated, um, ket minus, ket plus, and, and so forth. Um, and here's our, our point ket psi. The next thing we'll do is use the reverse stereographic projection to identify the Riemann sphere with the surface of a ball, the two sphere. Uh, the point AB, uh, A over B corresponding to psi, we connect to the north pole of our block sphere and it intersects a sphere at the point corresponding to the quantum state psi. I've drawn on this block sphere, the uh, points representing the other states we've mentioned, the orthonormal basis cat zero and cat one, north and south pole, east and west and typical points are cat minus and cat plus. I see I've got a typo here. And um, finally, we have cat minus i and cat i as antipodal points on the equator. Now, measurement, classical and quantum. Um, basically, and it's this little measuring a classical bit is so indicated. I thought I had something here. Uh, essentially, if we flip a, a coin and the uh, probability of, of the coin being heads is a measure of the fairness of the coin. So we could actually determine the state of a coin um, by flipping it many times and estimating uh, its fairness. This is the state of a uh, classical Shannon bit, some, a state space, um, and the, and the state space is the unit interval. Very simple. Measuring a qubit. Now, it's a totally different ball game. If a qubit is in a state, as so indicated, is measured with respect to the standard basis, then with probability um, magnitude of the coefficient alpha, which is called the amplitude, magnitude squared, we have the probability that we'll measure a ket zero and a probability of measuring a ket one is the magnitude of the other amplitude squared. And we always assume that the state is of unit length. Uh, we can measure with respect to other bases. There are many bases to measure with respect to. Um, we can measure with respect to the plus minus basis. Uh, for example, consider the, this orthonormal basis is so shown. It's, it's analogous to a 45 degree rotation. And we can re-express the, uh, the base, the ket and that basis is so shown. And thus, when we measure with respect to that basis, we have a totally different probability distribution as so indicated. And I'd like to just add one more basis here, the ket uh, i plus or minus i basis. And here, here's another indication of how, if it's measured with respect to that basis, we have uh, another probability distribution. Now, classical versus quantum uh, measurement, coin flips. Uh, the previous three examples of measurements with respect to a basis demonstrate emphatically how qubits differ from classical bits. We have seen that the classical coin, which when flipped, thus observed, produces heads or tails with probability as so indicated. For a, uh, but now let's compare that, a classical coin with the measurement of a qubit and the state so indicated. And of course, we assume it's of unit length. Unlike a classical bit, the qubit behaves as two different coins 
depending on which one of the two bases is chosen uh, as shown in the figure. Here it is. Um, this is our block sphere. And here is the um, ket we'd like to measure, ket psi on the block sphere. And if we measure that with respect to the standard basis, we'll get uh, probabilities as so indicated. However, it behaves like an uh, P0, this probability distribution uh, determines the latitude of the point on the block sphere. We can measure with respect to the plus minus basis, the Hadamard basis, and uh, we'll get an entirely different distribution. And in this case, the probability P plus denotes the great circle passing through the antipodal points east and west or ket minus and ket plus respectively. In this way, we, uh, we can locate the point, uh, the intersection of two great circles. There is an ambiguity. It's one of two possible intersections. We'd have to make a third measurement with respect to uh, the plus or minus I basis to uh, undo or uh, that ambiguity. But I, I think this is an interesting um, uh, way of looking. Quantum mechanics has a very interesting way of looking at this. Uh, somehow, uh, probability distributions are intertwined with the topology of the sphere in this case. There's more that can be said here. There are a lot of subtleties involved. Uh, more insight in terms, there's another way of looking at it, which I think is more insightful. And I can mention this because I'm talking to a group of uh, uh, topologists. Uh, we'll let H be the Hilbert space, the state space of the qubit, and let S3 be the two sphere inside this Hilbert space, um, um, so, def um, so defined in terms of the sums of the squares of the um, amplitudes. On the other hand, each quantum state is a complex line, which as a real manifold is simply a two-dimensional plane. Each state, which is a plane, a complex line, transversely intersects the uh, three-sphere in a one-sphere S1, so an intersection in a circle. Hence, all quantum states induce a foliation of S3 uh, of circles, S1. And by now, you probably recognized where we're going. Identifying each circle with a point to produ uh, produces the block sphere. In this way, we can see that the block sphere is simply the base space of the Hopf vibration. This way of looking at um, um, the state space for qubit is very useful when we move on to n-dimensional qubits or n qubits. Now I'd like to talk about multipartite systems beyond the single qubit. Um, so we need a few definitions. A multi-partite multi quantum system Q consists of n qubits. Here they are, uh, each living in its respective Hilbert space, two-dimensional Hilbert space. And collectively, uh, the state of the multi-partite system uh, is um, in the tensor product of the, uh, their respective Hilbert spaces. Um, if ket zero, ket one is, is designated as a standard orthonormal basis of each HJ, then, the, then the, these bases in each of the two dimensional Hilbert spaces induce a standard orthonormal basis um, as so indicated, they're simply tensor products of kets. And uh, each integer indicate is a way of referring to an n bit string um, the integer three refers to the string of all zeros ending in two ones and so forth, um, where the above integer labels denote the corresponding n-bit binary strings. Okay. Thus, the state psi of n qubits is of the following form. Once again, the integers 
our way of referring to n-bit binary strings, n-bit um, tensor products of kets. Um, in qubit bipartite systems, for n greater than one uh, qubits, the state H of a multipartite system is much more uh, uh, complex and more difficult to visualize. And I wish I had time to talk about it, uh, the corresponding vibrations. Um, but instead, I'll simply um, state that the, the dimension of the state space is, I see I haven't put dimension of an n-qubit multipartite state space is basically big O of two to the n. It grows exponentially. And for example, the dimension of a two qubit state is six. So we immediately move from one qubit, the block sphere, to a six dimensional space that moves up very quick, uh, quickly. A qubit behaves like two different coins depending on how it is observed. In the same vein, we could continue to pursue this for two qubits. And if we did so, we would encounter some amazing non-classical behavior, for example, the Bell inequalities. But this is only meant to be a brief introduction, so we need to move on. There is much more to quantum measurements. We've introduced quantum measurement in three steps, measurement of one qubit with respect to an orthonormal basis, measurement of n qubits with respect to orthonormal bases, and finally, the measurement of n qubits with respect to an eigenbasis of a Hermitian operator, also known in quantum mechanics as an observable. I wish I had more time to talk about this, uh, but I have one slide which explains it all. And here it is, uh, measurement in quantum mechanics. Uh, essentially, you have an observable, a Hermitian operator representing the measuring device. You have kept psi rep representing the unseen state. Somehow in this box, um, after the measurement is made, um, out comes uh, or an eigenvalue. This is read by the measuring device, which tells us uh, about which eigenspace the uh, state of the quantum system has fallen into. Of course, we cannot see the quantum state. We can only see the eigenvalue. There's much more to be said and um, we don't have time to say more. We'll need wiring diagrams to understand the paradox I'm talking about. So I'd like to just briefly talk about wiring diagrams. As previously mentioned, there are two types of quantum instructions, unitary transformations, uh, where we all know that the unitary transformation is defined by the fact the inverse is the adjoint of the operator. And Hermitian operators represent measurement, and they are the self-adjoint operators. However, we now incur a, a problem. As the number of n qubits grows, the size of the matrices of the instructions u and omega grow as 2, two to the n by 2 to the n, that is exponentially. And this um, is a predicament. How do we program a quantum computer when the instructions of the, uh, of the computer grow as big O of two to the N? The answer is to represent quantum computer programs as a wiring diagram, which grows linearly with the number of qubits. In a sense, the language of wiring diagrams is analogous to today's classical computer languages and so forth. Um, so let's take a look at this very briefly. What is a wiring diagram? A wiring diagram consists of lines and gates. A solid line corresponds to a qubit. A double line corresponds to a classical Shannon bit. A solid line labeled with a slash, it denotes n qubits. Uh, gates correspond to quantum computer instructions that is to unitary transformations and measurements. Those are two types of instructions. Okay, here are some examples of quantum computing 
uh, qubit gates. These are single qubit gates. The three poly spin operators, which represent in quantum mechanic uh, quantum mechanics infinitesimal spins about the x, y, and z axes. Um, I've given them as um, matrices in this case. Uh, the Hadamard transform, um, which is the Fourier transform for the group Z2. The phase gate, the pi over 8 gate. Here are some two qubit gates, the controlled not gate, the swap gate, the controlled Z gate. And of course, we need the measurement gate, which is indicated by a little, a small meter. In general, a wiring diagram is of the following form. It's a sequence of gates representing unitary operations. And of course, uh, uh, the product, uh, I, I note that the corresponding order of reversal when you take the matrix product, we all know about um, this convention. Consider the following wire di wiring diagram. This is equivalent to um, applying um, a first H tensor I, H to the first qubit, and C naught to the, uh, both qubits to produce, um, and here is just an example of the actual computation. Uh, and if we complete the computation, we see that this generates a entangled state called the Bell state. This is meant merely to be an example. Um, here's an exercise for you if you're interested in this. Show that the um, application of three controlled knot gates is uh, the same as a swap gate. Here I have a few more exercises. Um, I think I'll just, uh, you can look at these later. If you're interested, I'll put the slides on my website. And uh, I'd like to show you a um, wiring diagram simulator called Quirk that's on the web. I have a link here that will pull it up. Uh, you're all welcome to play with it. Uh, uh, whoever created it did, did a beautiful job. You can create your own circuits. For instance, uh, uh, let's create, uh, this is cat zero. We could change it to cat one, cat two, and so forth. The three basis elements, that, uh, three bases I talked about. This is your block sphere. Uh, indicating the uh, point on the block sphere you're represented by the state. Um, uh, this is your, um, um, this row of two boxes is your way of representing the amplitude of, ket, of the ket itself. Um, the length of the uh, center, uh, from the center to out, the little arrow, going from the center out to the boundary of the circle of the disk um, indicates the phase and the size of the circle, the magnitude. So this is a polar representation of the state. If I applied the Hadamard transform to that, uh, you get uh, basically um, the corresponding phases. Um, we could also apply a controlled knot gate as show, it's fun to play with it, I guess. It's a toy. Um, there are also gates that change with time. We um, can take the a poly spin operator raised to the uh, time power and apply that. In fact, let's take this out and uh, just put those in. And um, you'll notice that nothing is happening. Um, in this case, because we're only changing the an overall phase, so the block sphere point is not moving. You can do that with the, uh, let's see, uh, let's see, that's a phase change. Let's use this one. Uh, let's um, start with the Hadamard gate and um, put in a uh, time, uh, time Z gate. Now you can see that the point on the block sphere is moving around. However, you put it on the other side, um, staying still because the overall phase is physically undetectable. Enough of this. Let me um, get out of this uh, quirk and continue. Uh, whoops, I accidentally hit the wrong, wrong button again. Let me continue. Um, 
So finally, um, we can go to our conundrum. It's the end of the detour. Uh, this is a tale of three regions of space-time, and it begins as a story. Interstage right, a supervisor, and he bellows, build this physical system ASAP or else. Of course, he's a very pleasant boss. All right, here's the device. This is the blueprint of what he'd like to have built. It consists of three detectors, with each with a switch and uh, a source, which contains particles A, B, and C, which you can think of as kind of balls or qubits. And uh, these, when the blue button is pressed, the balls are emitted toward the respective detectors. And all right, what are the rules of the game here? The detector has uh, a red light and a green light on it and a switch which can be changed at any time uh, before uh, it receives, detects the, uh, the particle. Upon encountering a particle, the detector flashes either red one or green zero. Uh, each defector has a switch with two string, uh, two settings, zero and one, which can be randomly set at any time before the particle arrives. And here's the source, uh, a source containing three particles and a little blue button, which when pressed, ejects the particles A, B, and C towards the respective detectors. The supervisor is only interested in the switch settings for which an odd number of the sw three switches is set to one. That is um, 001, 010, and so forth. Those of essentially the switch settings are of hamming, odd hamming weight. No other switch settings are important. He, she doesn't care. Uh, about re the remaining four settings. We're only interested in these. Specification one, we need our specs to design the device. For each switch setting of Hamming weight one, after all three particles are detected, only an odd number of detectors are to flash red. Specification two, for sw uh, switch setting uh, of Hamming weight three, all after all particles received, only an even number of detectors are to flash red, or one. Uh, there are constraints. Detectors cannot communicate with one another. They are separated by a space-like distance and hence physically independent. Con constraint two. Um, um, upon leaving the source, the particles can no longer communicate with one another. And finally, constraint three, each particle uh, only communicates with a detector when it, when it encounters the detectors, when it's actually detected. All right. The supervisor leaves the room with an ominous command, build the system ASAP, and enter stage right, a design engineer who begins to analyze the blueprints and to see how it can be built. Since the detectors cannot communicate with one another, and after ejection, particles cannot communicate with one another, and particles only communicate with the detector upon impact, it follows immediately that each particle must carry instructions for its particular or respective detector. And here are the possible switch settings. Particle A carries instructions for um, um, the eighth detector. Uh, if the switch is set, uh, this is meant to be zero and one. This is a typo, forgot to correct it. If the switch is set to zero, uh, the detector will flash the, the color, uh, whatever color, color one is. And if the, um, setting is one, it will flash the color so indicated or instructed by uh, this value. And here are the remaining instructions for particles 
uh, for particle uh, B and for particle C. So um, each particle must carry its own instructions for its detector. And now we can see this uh, particle A must carry a local instruction of the following form. Um, if switch setting is zero, color CA zero. If switch setting is ones, color CA one. And in this way, we can see the instruction carried by each particle is a Boolean function. Uh, red stands for one and green stands for zero. In like manner, um, we have Boolean functions or instructions for the other two particles. They must carry these instructions. Uh, thus for J uh, equal A, B, and C, each local instruction is simply a Boolean function of the following form. Very simple. Uh, now let's look at the specifications. For switch settings uh, of Hamming weight one, only an odd number of detectors will flash red one. And for switch setting of Hamming weight three, only an even number of detectors will slack, uh, flash one. The first, uh, so this can be summarized in a set of linear equations over the field of two elements. The first three equations state that uh, Hamming weight detectors uh, um, with switch, excuse me, as if the switch settings are of uh, Hamming weight one, then the um, an odd number of uh, red flashes must occur. The second states that states that all the switch settings are set to one, um, then only an even number of flashes of red are made. But now we have a problem because it's easy to see that the specifications lead to a system of linear equations which are inconsistent. The sum of the top, uh, top three equations leads to an equation uh, for which um, the sum of all the uh, F, FA of one, FB of one, and FC of one is equal to one instead of zero. So ergo, since there is no such set of functions that satisfy the specifications, it cannot be built. Ah, the important thing now is that we should call in a uh, quantum computer scientist, excuse the, no, uh, the uh, whatever. Um, and of course, quantum computer scientists know everything. Begins to analyze the device and he sees that, say, let the three particles in the source be photons in the following entangled state as so indicated. So for instance, uh, this ket denotes the tensor product of three qubits, each in state zero and so forth. This is an entangled state because it cannot be factored into the tensor product of three space, uh, three uh, um, states. And as a result, the state of each individual qubit is indeterminate. The left qubit, uh, the state of the left qubit is not defined. The state of uh, the right qubit is not defined. And the state of the middle qubit is also indeterminate. However, the state of the entire system is um, well-defined. Um, and we can let ket zero stand for horizontally polarized um, photons and ket one for vertically polarized photons. Okay, please note that uh, this is entangled. It cannot be factored into the tensor product of three separate qubits. Um, the state of each qubit is indeterminate. The state of all three is well-defined. This is, in a certain sense, what we mean by quantum entanglement. Here's our detector. And what we're going to do is we're going to insert a Hadamard transform uh, for switch setting one. And for switch setting zero, we'll simply use um, attach the unitary operator, the identity operator. 
Uh, and once again, I'd like to remind you, this is our Hadamard transform. And hence, um, um, H simply takes our standard basis into our plus minus basis. And now we'd like to define a Boolean unitary transformation as a map from the um, set of all k-bit strings, binary strings into a group of unitary transformations. In the same way, a Boolean Hermitian operator is a map from uh, the set of k-bit strings, binary strings into the algebra of observables. In other words, Boolean unitary and Boolean Hermitian operators are unitary and Hermitian operators controlled by classical bits. That's all that means. Now, let's let b equal zero, one, and if b is equal to zero, one, if u is a unitary operator, then u b, u super b denotes um, the operator identity matrix or operator, unitary transformation, if b is zero. Otherwise, if b is one, um, it denotes the unitary transformation u, where i is the identity. Okay, in like manner for observables, um, essentially you either get the zero observable or the observable itself, depending on whether or not um, b is set to zero or one. These are controlled operators. Now, finally, we can build this device or produce a wiring diagram that tells us how to build the device. Here it is. We have a input of uh, three qubits, each prepared in a state, ket zero. We apply a Hadamard transform and two control knots to produce what is called the GHC state. Then we have these two unitary transformations, which transform this into the state so indicated. And at the other end, uh, we have the switch settings, which control uh, uh, the devices. Uh, and the hollow dot indicates that when the control is zero, H is applied. And when the control is one, H is not applied. A solid dot does just the opposite. And then we have a measurement with respect to the um, standard basis. Uh, single lines represent qubits, double lines represent classical bits. This is our control knot operator. Um, it only flips the bit, second bit, when it's one. It does nothing if it's zero. Uh, this is our measurement operator. We've seen this before. And uh, this is our Hadamar transform. If the switch setting is one, it does nothing. If the switch setting is zero, it applies the Hadamard. And finally, U is this unitary transformation that uh, essentially rotates our state to put it to the proper form. And where X, Y, and Z are the poly spin operators. So once again, this is the circuit. Um, let's see here. If I'm going too fast, let me know. And uh, we can actually simplify the circuit by using uh, a different measurement gates. Uh, the following one, we can absorb the unitary transformations in the gate, but just measuring with respect to uh, a rotated basis. And in this way, uh, we have a observable as so defined, it either behaves as the um, measurement with respect to the standard basis or measurement with respect to the Hadamard basis. And we now simplified this and now we can see that the function is defined. It's a very strange function indeed. After the measurement, uh, essentially we have the values uh, needed um, to produce the result. This is a partial function and it these values only exist when they're measured. It's very weird indeed. Uh, but let's look at this and analyze the system a little bit. And um, what do the three detectors see for each of the four possible uh, legal switch settings? And we have the switch settings and uh, we have the controlled Hadamard transforms in our device. 
If the hemming weight is three of the switch settings, then the resulting state uh, is of the following form. <clears throat> You'll notice that each label, I, I'm almost done. Um, each label um, is of ham, even hamming weight. On the other hand, for the other three switch settings of hamming weight one, um, the kits are all labeled by uh, strings of odd hamming weight. And so, for instance, if um, if the switch, switch setting is of hamming weight three, uh, essentially what happens when we make a measurement? Well, with probability one fourth, we'll see uh, all zeros. Uh, uh, that's, uh, I guess, all green. Probably. And uh, on the other hand, with probability one fourth, we'll see um, a red, green, green. Uh, hope I haven't switched the colors. Uh, we'll see red, uh, green, red, and so forth. So this is all green, green. And uh, I reversed the colors, um, not on the slide, but when I said them. Um, and so in this case, the specs are actually satisfied. Therefore, always an even number of reds when the hamming weight is three. And here's an example of having weight one switch setting. Go through the same thing and you can see. That um, uh, always an even number of lights flash red. So this actually implements a device that cannot be implemented using classical physics. So where has the proof of impossibly gone impossibility gone awry. We actually proved it. And the proof of impossibility is based on the following proposition. I've stated it more cryptically um, than I did in the past. And the point of, is that actually the logic is flawless. The system of linear equations is consistent. And, but the crooks of the matter is that an argument is only as sound as the assumptions upon which it is based. It's a correct argument, but it's based on the wrong assumptions. More explicitly, the argument fails because at least one of the following tacitly assumed two assumptions fails. And these are perfectly reasonable assumptions. And what are they? Premise one which is called the principle of reality. What is measured is completely determined before it is measured. Principle two, principle of locality, space-like separated regions of space-time since they can, uh, are physically independent. There is no way to send a signal from one to the other, hence they are uh, physically independent of one another. The above two premises lead to the following unfounded conclusions. Unfounded conclusion one, based on premise one, the reality principle, the detector lamp instructions must indeed be predetermined, well-defined total functions at the time of particle injection. They're not determined until the measurement is actually made. And unfounded conclusion two, Based on premise two, the principle of locality, the detector lamp instructions must be local. They certainly aren't local. Hence, the functions fj uh, are, are, fj is a function only of the j switch setting and sj um, and independent of the two other switch settings. This is not the case. The correlation of the space like, the information in the correlation of the space-like separated uh, states is actually being used. This is non-local. Uh, um, so let's go back. Um, here's a corollary. Essentially, you can, these actually, uh, these probability distributions are interrelated to one another. Um, there is a Boolean dependence among them, which is kind of interesting. 
This is analogous to thinking about the block sphere. The geometry of the block sphere actually imposes um, algebraic dependencies among the different probability distributions arising from um, uh, the measurement bases. Um, and here it is. I, I think I'll not uh, spend much time on this. If you're interested in this, you can read the paper. In other words, the GHG paradox shows us how to create three space-like separated, hence physically independent probability distributions that have the above algebraic dependence. Okay, I mentioned that. Um, here is an implementation in Quark of the device. It's loading, here it is. Here is, a, this pro produces the GHC state. Then we have the unitary transformations U that I mentioned. Um, uh, then the Hadamard transform, this is a, for switch setting of Hamming weight three, and then the measurements. And I uh, just wanted to show that. Let me get out of this. You can play, I put a link in the slide so that you can get to that if you want to play with it. And that's the end. And uh, I find this very weird indeed. Okay, let me stop the share. Are there any questions? Hello? Thank you. Uh, could you put up again the link to your web pages where the slides are? Okay. I haven't put the slides up, but I can put up the link. Just a moment. Oh, oh uh, they aren't on your web page yet. I'll put them up very soon. Okay. Okay. And if you would send me your slideshow, oh yeah, I'll put it. In, I'll put it in our Dropbox mm -hmm. along with this recording, which will then be available to everyone. Good. Are there any questions? I think this function is a very strange and function indeed. Um, that's created by the entanglement. It's it's actually non-local, whatever that means. Questions? Can you expand on that remark a little bit? When you say non-local, the uh, there's information in an in entanglement somehow, which is not understood. There is information. Uh, stored in the correlation of of the the different particles, and if the since the particles are separated by a space like distance, they're physically independent. Yet it's still there, and upon measurement, that non-local information is actually used. And this is not fully understood. It's very strange. And it has to do with the function like you described in the paper that uh, about about the device that cannot be is that that the, expresses the paper? Uh -huh. uh, uh, oh yes thank you that yeah. expresses the um, um, you you essentially what you're producing when you make a measurement you're producing a probability distribution mm -hmm. remember the probability distributions actually on the block sphere actually determine the position of the ket itself. Now these uh, probability uh, distributions are related to one another. They're actually related and that Boolean function actually expresses that dependence in an algebraic way. And um, now there are some other things to keep in mind. Um, essentially, um, if you may, uh, you make a different measurement, it's a, each switch setting corresponds to an um, incompatible measurement. You can't measure both at the same time. So talking about two probability distributions based on two different measurements is called in quantum um, physics counterfactual. Uh, this is analogous to the um, uh, wave particle duality. If you make one measurement, uh, you can detect the wave properties of light. If you make another 
uh, measurement incompatible one, you can detect the um, uh, particle nature of light. Now the, and um, those are counter, counterfactual representations. It's non-contradictory because you can't make both at the same time. There's a lot to this. And uh, uh, there's a, I must say, I'm not sure I not understand all of it. It's very interesting indeed. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes. Uh, well, <laughs> and also motivated, is motivating to further maybe think about these questions. Uh, oh, yes. It's fascinating. What's interesting is that the probability distributions are intertwined with the topology. And I tried to illustrate that by just looking at a qubit. Those probability distributions are not independent of one another in the qubit, or not, they are related to one another because the, um, the state space of the qubit is not a plane, it's a sphere, which has um, as non-trivial non topologically. And that, that was actually the point I was trying to get across. The topology is, in a certain sense, determining the, the probability distributions. Okay. Two, we have time, two more questions. We have sure. time? Sure. Okay. One, I guess I'll do. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, one of them is... Uh, what do the what do the probability measures? These are the probabilities for what exactly in physical world or observable world in terms of physics? They correspond to, uh, to probability of what? Uh, the second question is when you mentioned a whole fi a vibration loss here, you went over it a little bit quickly. I'm uh, sorry, I didn't have much time. A quantum state intersecting a string in a circle. Um, I don't quite follow uh, what, why there will why uh, the intersect is the is a quantum state like a plane that is, yes. uh, is it oh, okay. okay? It's a complex line, and as a complex line as a as a real manifold is a two-dimensional plane. You've got the X and Y component of a complex number. Mm -hmm. So it's really two, it's a two-dimensional real manifold. And that two-dimensional real manifold of plane will intersect the three sphere in a circle. Mm -hmm. And uh, transversely, and those circles actually foliate the entire two sphere and that's really, and then you identify each uh, um, circle to a point and you end up with the block sphere. So it's, it's the Hopf vibration. Okay. Another way of looking at the Hopf vibration is thinking of uh, the three spheres being the union of two, uh, two tori. You could do it that way, um, um, solid tori. But um, I think this is, um, I like this approach better, but I'm, that's personal. Okay. And what was your second question? I, I, you already, I think you already answered the second. Did one. I answer it? Yeah, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, uh, hmm. well, the, well, the answer was, uh, the question was that, Oh, the probabilities, what do the probabilities in uh, qubit, uh, what do they correspond to in physical world? That, that was the question. Uh, or maybe. Well, uh, let's suppose um, you have a pair of polarized sunglasses and a qubit is either, can, uh, uh, an orthonormal basis of a qubit is either, can be horizontally, horizontally polarized light are vertically polarized light. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason you wear those when you're driving is the light reflecting off the highway, I believe is horizontally 
polarized. Your sunglasses filter that out and view only the vertical polarized light and hence eliminate the road glare. Your sunglasses are actually measuring the qubits, right? If you see a Q, uh, uh, the light coming through, you know it's um, vertically polarized. If you don't see it, then it's not. So you've actually performed a measurement. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, that's one of the, uh, I try to create a simple example that you see every day. There are lots of other examples. And uh, I hope that's of some help. Okay. Is there a place to maybe briefly read about those examples? Well, uh, I, well, yes. <laughs> now that you mentioned it, let's see here. If I, uh, I could share the screen again. Uh, where do I share? Oh, here it is. Share screen. And uh, let's see. Here we go, and let's go up here. And here is, okay. And if you go here, you could uh, look at, uh, there's an article, this is written for mathematicians. Uh, it's based on a, a short course we gave to the American Math Society uh, in 2000. And if you go uh, to uh, table, no, here it is. Uh, here's an article which gives a con introduction to quantum mechanics and to quantum computation. And you can uh, download this if you wish. It's also on the archive, the article. And basically uh, it talks about all of this. Of course, I'm advertising my own book. I don't make any money on this book, by the way. Um, uh, there's a section on measurement here. I, I can't find it this time, but you can, uh, you can take a look at it. If you have any questions, just feel free to email me and I'll do my best to, to answer them. I always on my website, PowerPoint presentation based on this paper and um, that's in the book. Uh, but there are a lot of good books out there. The, a very good book is by Nielsen and Chuang. It's a little dated now, but it's amazingly well-written. Uh, in fact, I have it on my desk here somewhere. Where, do, where is it? Yes, here it is. I recommend this book. I guess you can see it by Nielsen and Chuang. It's really good. Covers a lot of material. Uh, other books, uh, let's see. I was just teaching a course in quantum computing this semester. Uh, let's see, here's, oh, here's a very good book. Uh, by um, um, uh, Kay Lafamme and Mosca. I, rec I recommend this, it's well-written. Uh, there's so many good books. Here's a book by Merman on quantum computing. Uh, there's another book by um, uh, Rifle and Pollock, a general introduction to quantum computing. And um, so, and if you, I'm sure there are many more good books out there. Um, uh, Quite a few of them, in fact. Is uh, Nielsen the one that you recommend the most, the first one? It, well, it depends. Uh, it's the most sophisticated of the book three or four books that I showed you. Um, for my students, um, I usually don't show them this book immediately because it's too advanced for them. The others are more introductory than this. But if we combine it with your book. Uh, oh, yes. I, I like that idea. Sounds good. So if we, I'm if joking. Your book and, then, and then get this book as a backup, then the two together would. Yeah, you could if you'd like. Yeah. Um, it's um, 
That's a good way to begin. I recommend, oh yes, I didn't recommend my book. That's right, I should have recommended the, the book. It has a set of articles. One is written by Luke Kaufman too, in there. Uh, and one is bit, written by Peter Shore and um, Alexi Katayev and all of those. So that's, um, um, th that's a good way to begin. But there's so many books out there now, it's hard to say that, is there a best one? It's hard to say that. Well, no, uh, it's better just to have a recommended one from someone. Right. Who's yeah. like that. Um, that's a good way to begin. Begin with the, uh, uh, the, um, the survey article and the other articles in my book, as well as the uh, uh, Nielsen and Chuang. That's a good way, a good way to go. It's fun. But there are so many open problems here uh, relating quantum mechanics and topology seems to be an integral part of this. And I've said it earlier in the talk, I was, when I was talking about the block sphere, the topology actually is, um, has much to do with the interdependencies of the probability distributions that occur when measurements are made. And I don't think it's well understood. Um, maybe just a dumb question. Uh, so the circuit that you showed that, that solves the problem uh, in your talk, Yes. Um, that so we can just we can create that right. Like you could actually do that experiment. Sure. Uh, I put the link in the, in my uh, talk. So uh, when the, I'll put it on the web uh, sometime today on my on my website, uh, you can just go to Quirk and build your own circuit, and it's fun to I play think, with. I think Scott is asking uh, about actual physical realization. Maybe you can, because you could build it on the IBM actual quantum computer. Right. All right. I'm assuming that. And that's why I said it was probably a dumb question, but. No, no, not at all. In fact, you can think of a uh, uh, quirk as a way of developing the uh, uh, program, which is a wiring diagram. Those are the instructions that you could put on uh, the IBM Q, for instance or the INQ or any others of uh, these other quantum computers. That is a, uh, or gate-based computers. Um, that's a way of, uh, that's how you can program a computer. In fact, uh, you've just, uh, or watching the talk, you've just programmed a quantum um, uh, algorithm on a quantum computer. fun. Um, Are there other questions? I mean, is there this, I, I have this vague feeling that is, is can the, can how the uh, human mind operates be compared or likened in some way to a, a quantum computer? And have, have there been people writing or thinking about uh, how human minds work and or uh, operate and uh, quantum mechanics, or is that a little? Uh, no, there out? is a certainly there's literature on that. Well, Roger Penrose uh, is um, is one of the people that think it has something to do with uh, uh, quantum mechanics, how the thought processes. I'm not sure I agree with him, but um, you can essentially. Uh, um, He's written some papers on that. And a lot of other people have. There was recently an online conference on consciousness. And uh, I don't know about that. I, uh, we, should, uh, we could mention that Penrose, in fact, has two books on that. Actually, yes. Emperor, the books. Emperor's New Mind and Shadows of the Mind. Right. Of course, I'd like to mention those. Uh, there are many highly speculative components of those books. Yeah. It's fun to speculate, but what's real and what's not real is a good question. Have people attempted to do actual experiments with Penrose's ideas or anything combining neuroscience with quantum uh, physics? I think neuroscience, that, that's what yeah. Penrose does. Okay. Yeah, but I, I mean, think that there are people, people trying. Hmm? Hmm. 
Penrose collaborates with a neuroscientist about some of these possibilities. Okay. Hammer off. Right, yeah. I guess about a month ago, they had a conference um, on uh, just this particular topic. Oh, what, what, uh, is, do you know the address for the conference? Uh, I'll have to look or it up. Google search would. Uh, where was the conference? It may have been at, um, I'd, I'd have to look it up. I'm sorry, I don't remember. I'll okay. try to find it for you. Um, do you know Lou, by any chance? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, how about, um, well, maybe these, uh, some of these talks are to do with knots, right? And so uh, what, what sort of, um, can you maybe, uh, um, uh, how should we, how should one think knots in relation to quantum computation? Maybe that's, that's well, one thing you can say is the following that it is a fact that all the unitary transformations you could possibly want for quantum computing, actually for finite dimensional quantum mechanics, can be generated by representations of the break group, by a coherent representation of the break group. That's mathematical and it's correct. So the whole but, thing is just braids. But finding an uh, implementation of that is uh, very difficult. That's, yeah, the, the, this week I missed the talk, but I will watch the recording. There, there was one talk on uh, um, braids. Uh, oh. Roger, Roger Fenns uh, and Luz uh, collaborate. Uh, co-organized meetings on Tuesday. Now, so far, uh, they haven't been able to find a viable implementation they can do something with in um, topological quantum computing. It's greatly debated uh, whether it will work or not. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, everything in quantum mechanics is debated. That's the fun of it. Um, uh, what, 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 oh, sorry. Um, if I wanted to teach a course on quantum computing, uh, you, you threw up one book that you said that you do you use with your students. What, 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 which well, one I've recommend? tried several books um, this semester. Um, let's see, what book did I use? Um, there's one other book. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, just the best way to learn something. Uh, I can send you the book. It's by, I'm just trying to remember the name. Um, there are many books, and I, I haven't, uh, let me get, but let me I stop the share, I guess. Um, am I, have I stopped the share? I haven't, I guess, or have I? You're not I, sharing. Screen okay, right I'm not now. sharing. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can get you the name of a book. I could try looking right now on my website. Um, not my website, but uh, well, well, we're doing that. Um, I want to thank you, Sam, for this, and uh, I'm going to stop the recording. We can keep on okay. talking, but we'll stop the recording at this okay. point. Great well, talk, thank you. Thank you, and it's it was a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation.